like I said, there's other reads like Wikipedia page if you want to look at some code examples. Um, so Rust is, I, I find Rust interesting. So I started on a new project a couple years ago and I was picking out a programming language to write it in. And my contenders were Rust and Go and I ended up using Go um, uh, for reasons I don't want to go into too all the details. But I definitely was keeping my eye on Rust and thought it was, it was very interesting. Um, it's like reading this article is like, oh, now I really want to get back and learn it. Um, so uh, it, I guess more as at a philosophical level. Um, I do like the idea of, of building in important safety parameters into the compiler itself um, so that uh, uh, you don't have all the problems that C and C++ have, which are, I think, really bad. Um, so I do like the idea of Rust. Um, actually using it in practice, I've never actually done so. Um, I'm, I'm, I suspect some of you have, so you're you're happy to... Uh, uh, if you want to like tell, like if you've used Rust plus other languages and you have insight, please uh, go into it. One thing, so like the past couple of years, I've been using Go pretty heavily. Um, how Go handles concurrency with its channels sort of system. Um, I was a bit confused about it at first. Once I wrapped my mind around it, I thought it was very intuitive. Um, and I'm not quite sure how you would do the same thing in Rust. It doesn't seem to have a, a exact thing like that. It seems like it would involve passing ownership around or using callback functions or something. Um, so if you are a, a rustic and you can you can explain that to me um, and that, that I would enjoy that at least um, so on a more philosophical level um, is sort of rust the right answer um, it is nice that it's trying to try to like replace C++ without the um, you know the, the horrible things you can do with C++ um, I'm not sure it's gonna be it should be used for everything I think like garbage collection, does have its place, especially if you don't want to have to do the work to make it as, as hyper fast as possible. Um, and so since garbage collecting is sort of a general solution to that problem. Um, but uh, yeah, so I'm, I say we just, um, these guys go down. Um, uh, actually, if, if Anraj wants to go next, we can go on Raj and skip me and then go down. Um, that, that sounds easiest. So uh, do you want to say something? Uh, yeah, I can go. Uh, so this article uh, mostly seems like, uh, yeah, trying to promote uh, Rust among the people. <laughs> and <laughs> Stack Overflow, the even Stack Overflow, 97% of the developers have not used it. So I don't know where that, uh, uh, the title of the article comes from it, that it's the most, uh, uh, world's most loved programming language. So I don't know about that. <clears throat> But I've used it a bit, so I've written simple uh, language, uh, hello world programs and uh, uh, kernel modules in it. So I got interested in it when uh, last year I think it was going to be merged into the Linux kernel. And then I started following it and I start, attended some workshops for it. But I still don't understand exactly how the memory safety is uh, working. So what I understand is that uh, you do some compile time, uh, compile time checks. But a lot of these checks you can already do in C++ and or C. I mostly write C and like these compile time checks and C, like a lot of the safety critical system today are written in C and you can make it as safe as Rust. But the cost of making it safe is like the productivity goes down a lot when you try to make it safe. Uh, and that the, the claim that Rust rust is completely safe and there would be no problems with uh, rust uh, that is a little uh, questionable for me because you don't write a system entirely in like uh, in isolation you write it in uh, write it in a way that interacts with other systems too and that systems could have problems and <clears throat> the other thought was that uh, the uh, putting the compile time checks into the or the safety checks into the compiler itself like the, even the compiler is written in Rust, right? They are written, by, it's written by people. So even there, you could introduce some problems. And so it's the claim that uh, Rust would solve all memory safety issues and you would achieve some sort of uh, memory safety nirvana is, uh, is uh, it, I find it laughable. Uh, and the other, and the, about the prompt, <clears throat> the prompt was, uh, uh, 
human uh, memory systems and how it relates to human and ai memory systems so one of the thought that uh, i was having was that we like humans don't have uh, uh like a perfect memory so we tend to forget a lot and uh, we don't even remember properly and like sometimes uh, like i've heard read articles that you can make people remember that uh completely have different memories than what actually happened so so like we don't have a really like a safe uh, as humans like a safe memory and our memory is uh, uh it's like really uh, buggy it seems but some people say that it it's kind of a feature that humans don't remember everything and uh, yeah so so that was my thought about the prompt and then i'll pass on to venkat no oh, wait just just a second didn't we say last time that grigory should not be last i've been last once so i know what it's like okay so i'll pass on to grigory uh, when i when i i thought you were going to pass on to brian and then we would go down ah uh, okay no. yeah so brian take it away all right all right um they don't know uh I guess I've I've called myself a developer a programmer but it's really in the like front of the front end um like I can write passable javascript to make things interactive whatever so I've never really had to deal with the sort of problems because even the javascript I write it is like very procedural um it's like I don't do very much in like react or anything that manages state it's like very much like click a button make this menu toggle on and off kind of things um and i think part of the reason why i gravitated towards front end things and not back end things like that would have drawn me into like c or rust or java or anything like that is that um i don't particularly care about managing memory and keeping all of these keep, keeping track of everything on the back end uh like i think i just there's something about me that likes the small scale of like presentation layer things um so i guess uh i've i've never i say that because i've never really been exposed to the difference between c or rust or like some of these problems and um i guess taking my sort of tendencies into account like uh if i were a back end programmer it seems like i would gravitate towards something like c that is very explicit that like you set something somewhere and it stays there and if uh if it screws something up that's that's your own fault and you have to like go in and and fix that versus uh something that kind of handles that for you that's kind of my my general understanding very very kindergarten level um but that kind of gets me to the the prompt of like what is memory safety or like why is it important in the context of like people or ai and it, it reminded that question reminded me of like uh leaving objects around the house and like if i i i live alone and if i set something somewhere there's nobody that's besides me that's going to move it so i can remember and if there was somebody else living with me or if i had a cleaning service that was coming in and and tidying things up that kind of feels like the uh kind of sort of garbage collection thing that the, this was alluding to um and again i kind of gravitate towards the like i know exactly where i left something and if i can't find it it's my own fault um cuz it, it i guess that's a it comes down to like a sense of control and and human agency versus like abstracting it into a system that can do its own thing um but i think that's that's where a lot of like it's I guess sort of a lazy thing I guess to just like uh, we don't want to have to deal with it 
and we don't want to have something be our own fault so we're going to abstract it into something that uh is a little bit opaque and um may or may not like lead to us making mistakes further down the line because we don't know what's actually going on and like forensic kind of things could get harder um so that's kind of my mismatch of ideas so i'll pass it to uh commits oh it looks like commits is on in... listen mode so we'll go to gregory Okay, I, I am not a programmer, so um, I just uh, read uh, an article like uh, a non-fiction. Um, the first reaction was that, in my view, it's a little bit like uh, being disciplined in communication. Um, basically, you can go in two different directions. One direct is to produce a lot of garbage and then uh, basically figuring out how to throw it away. Uh, alternative way is uh, not to produce any garbage, um, which requires you to be disciplined. Uh, so uh, I agree with Brian that uh, one way looks easier for lazy people and the other way being disciplined in something including being disciplined in uh, communication or memory safety uh, is a, a little bit more involved i would say uh, but at the same time if you do not produce any garbage you save a lot of effort in the first place so kind of um interesting that uh when you go uh, one level deeper uh, and you're trying to be disciplined uh it's not a 180 degree turn from being lazy it's something completely different you save yourself a lot of effort and you save yourself a lot of time uh, for being disciplined. Uh, one concern that I have, and uh, you kind of can read it in a, in a paper, that developing a discipline in a communication requires time and effort. It's a particular style of, uh, uh, you know, of writing programs or talking to other people. Uh, you kind of, uh, after a little while, after you master the style, you can be easily annoyed by people not following this. Uh, for example, not giving you the answer in a way that you expect uh, to be given, or not uh, asking a question in a particular way you expect the question to be asked. Uh, so you have to go back uh, and uh, repeat stuff uh, and uh, being a little bit uh, unclear, uh, not exact. Uh, so uh, in distributed systems, uh, this effect of being disciplined seems to be uh, even greater because uh, if somebody has to throw away the garbage, uh, I mean collective garbage, then first he has to figure out whether it's garbage or not, especially if another person left. Uh, so uh, when you have a distributed system, uh, the difference between being lazy and being disciplined is, is even greater. And then I'll pass it on to Jenna. Additionally. I think she's on listen mode. So. Okay, so I'll 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 talk. Um, I, I'm 
I'm not going to talk about programming as such, but I, I think the way Rust handles memory is similar to the way the original iOS handled apps. You have a problem when you have a computer with multiple things running at the same time that they can interact, they can <clears throat> use up all your memory, they can use up your battery. And the solutions that they used in the original iOS was you can only have, your telephone can only be one application at a time, and your applications can't talk to each other. Each one has its own, let's call it sandbox. So that was wonderful for building a machine that works and works, but less wonderful for people who have, let's call it a, a workflow where they use one app and then another app and then a third app. And then we started seeing all sorts of cracks in this uh, multiple sandbox. You had the files that anybody could access and you started having other ways for communication and, and sharing between applications. And it seems to me that what Rust is doing is something similar. Each element of memory belongs to somebody, is created at some time, is used up at some time, can be transferred if you want. And that is very, very explicit and constraining. So, in a sense, I would say that it's it's like the difference between being motivated by fear, which is what Rust seems to be doing, and being motivated by freedom, which is what C uh, used to have. And it could be that there are applications where that is what's important. Like, you know, I want to make sure my phone doesn't crash. I want to make sure that my elevator doesn't crash just when I'm coming home half drunk at uh, one in the morning. But when I want to give um, flexibility to the programmer, it's a problem. Now, the reason why I'm looking at it like this is because we are in a distributed system uh, conversation. And there's always a question of how much control do we impose in order to make things easy to do. And Rust gives one suggestion, and other programming languages give the opposite suggestion, and maybe because they're not, let's call it mission critical. Instead, you have garbage collection, you have the possibility of crashing, but you also have much more flexibility to do whatever you want. Um, so when I look at this, I don't know what my preferences are, but I think it really is a question of the end use. And I think the type of distributed systems we're talking about uh, are much closer to the type that you build in Python as compared to the type you build in Rust. So I think this is a solution, but I don't know if we need it, and I don't know if uh, we're willing to pay the price, which it's not clear to me what the price is, but when I look at what happened with iOS, it seems to me that there is a price, otherwise Apple wouldn't have uh, broken the walls between the compartments. Uh, Nathan. Um, okay, uh, so I think I don't actually have that many thoughts uh, with everything. I think just to reference the prompt um, about the sort of an ELI-5 uh, with memory safety, um, I'm not sure I could give a good general example. I think actually the example with the chalkboard is pretty good. Um, but another way you could think about it might be like putting um, coins on a uh, checkerboard and you have a little, you make a little tally about like who has which coins in which sequence of squares. So, you know, Anuraj is, you know, squares one through three and they're pennies and Ben is squares, you know, four through 
five, four and five, and it has nickels or something like that. Um, and then the idea is that, you know, where, where some of these problems, and there's lots of memory problems, this is just like one particular class, is like, if you read that wrong, then you can get unexpected results. So sort of the the, the, the classic one would be sort of, you know, overflowing. Um, so maybe Anuraj can say, well, actually, um, I'm going to, I'm going to change my coins. I'm going to put in uh, pennies, but I'm actually going to put in four pennies now. And so now Anuraj's pennies have overridden some of Ben's nickels. And suddenly Ben has a different, different value. Ben now has six cents instead of 10 cents there and that can have and you don't want that ben would be very upset uh, to find out that four pennies are now gone um so that might be one way of thinking about it i think it actually sort of it actually really points out the difference between computer memory and human memory um and the way because computer memory is very much like it's bit by bit by bit by bit, but human memory is, well, we want to reconstruct sort of a state. You know, I want to, I want to remember this thing. And so I've kind of put my brain into that state, which is a lot of bits and is a lossy process. It's not an exact process. And some of the, some folks have already hit on that. And so we're not actually reconstructing like oh there were x number of pennies on x places we're kind of like well there was a board and had some pennies on and there were more up here and less down there and there were some nickels somewhere and that's kind of good enough because we we sort of deal for the most part because we deal with these sort of big swaths of things and then you know when we started having to deal with more particular things and remember more details you know we invented writing <laughs> um you know we all so many of like the older like mesopotamian writing uh surviving writing is it's it's all like how many farm animals did you have or what were your taxes like very discreet things like that and so we've been really we think of computer memory like human memory but it's actually more like our memory aids and i think where that that becomes interesting sort of with ai because a lot of the machine learning models right now they don't really have memory they're not really remembering things they're just you know it's these statistical prediction um it's almost like the uh like sort of the the china like the i think this is the chinese box puzzle was it called is you had somebody and they're just copying words and they have a big lookup table, but they don't understand, you know, it's a, it's a translation system for, for, you know, English to Chinese or whatever, I think was the original example. And you just have a big lookup table and there's somebody who's copying words. And so you feed some sentence in, you get another sentence out in, in English or Chinese or whatever, but there's no actual thought that's happening inside of the box. But could you really tell that? Could you really tell that there's not actually somebody thinking there? And the, the answer was sort of like, no. You couldn't. Um, and I think it's a lot of what's going on with these machine learning models. They're, they're Chinese boxes. Like they're doing this matching, but they don't really have memory. And then when we're going to hook them to memory, we're hooking, the thought is, well, we're going to hook them to things like computer memory. But that's very different than what human memory is. That's not saying, well, go back and put yourself in a state like you were. That's like, oh, go to this lookup table. And that's not what people do in their heads. And so I think it's, that's kind of interesting because it does suggest that what's happening with AI, particularly when we begin coupling these large language models to more compute, to databases and things like that, we're building something that's fundamentally very different than what's actually going on in our own heads. And I, I think people don't really um, maybe appreciate that. Um, that doesn't really talk about distributed systems, but I think I've actually talked um, long enough, so I want to I want to just pass on to to Sachin at this point. Yeah, I don't have a lot to add since I think a lot was covered. But um, yeah, I think about the AI um, and the Chat GPT style things. I think what Nathan said is uh, it seems true um, that. Basically, when you have a conversation with it, it doesn't seem like it's not exactly 
learning or referring a previous state it's just predicting what next to say that would make the most sense um and even in like and even in small conversations it's not referring back to a previous state it's just saying the next thing that is that makes sense uh, in either an interesting way or um in a yeah and i think that produces this sort of state of it's like speaking to somebody uh, like a really smart person with dementia or like somebody with bpd or something um uh, and um and, and that, that that's interesting and like i i wonder if it will if it can be uh if it can reach a state where um a chat program could refer a previous state uh instead of predicting the next interesting thing to say um such as like i was playing around with it yesterday uh with writing writing a scene and um so it would write something and then i'd be like um summarize this book on writing dialogue and now use what you learned to write the dialogue and then it would make modifications and then it would sort of forget it later on um so i i wonder if it would be able to sort of replicate a particular uh state um that has learned um and and i think that's like so uh, with respect to human memory it seems very different because um with human memory y- you are basically able to refer uh refer to one uh, you're more likely to forget things that were like mid term in the past like I, i i i probably forgot something last week that i did something last week or three days before then something that uh, then like stronger memories i have from my childhood or something uh, and so like we we refer to memory differently um and uh, so um and yeah and if if you have like talked to somebody with like alzheimers uh, it's like um they are they speak very confidently of things that happened in their childhood so it's almost like the things that you uh, those memories are the last to go away uh, which is um interesting and it's also interesting in the sense of like um uh, um when people speak uh, i i sometimes think um it it kind of does the same thing that chat gpt does in that you're speaking of the memories that you're most confident of and you're sort of like making it up as you go um and so in that way which is why like which is why maybe those patterns are um hard to distinguish like nathan says like y- you could have the same pattern of behavior as a human because of that yeah, maybe i don't know yeah anyway uh sridhar All right. Um yeah, I I don't know, this kind of threw me back because I um one of my favorite courses in college was uh taking like a design your own programming language course where we learned scheme and then use scheme to design our own language. Um and I I guess maybe I identify with the people who love Rust because um up until then I was just coding in Python, uh but I really enjoyed the level of like orderliness and um I guess I don't know almost like an explicitness or something that functional programming requires uh I think I felt like the, you know the takes that some people had of um like almost like being cynical about this problem and like kicking it back up to like human agency or something kind of rubbed me the wrong way because um it's not really like that like I think when you're dealing with large distributed systems it's like a truly like an you know an ex uh an exploitation happening some at some other level like not at a human level like a compiler level um and that's what this problem at least from what i can understand is getting is is grasping towards um of course like then the question is like okay design something better or like or like account for that um and i, I think that's what rust is doing uh or like memory safe languages are actually an effort to do that um so i don't know maybe i misunderstood the level of cynicism or something um 
It also reminded me of, like, uh, continuous passing style, which I think is almost like um, like a design feature that addresses similar types of problems. I posted a link about it. Ironically, uh, that was the part of the course that I uh, performed the worst in because it was so complex or something. Um, and then I guess, like, the last thing is this also kind of reminded me of, like, uh, MEV or, like, maximum extractable value um, exploitations in, uh, like, Web3 crypto, blockchain, whatever systems. Um, obviously, it's different because uh, there's no, like, concept of memory, per se. Like, uh, people are actually competing for the order through which, like, transactions are computed. Um, but, I don't know, it just seemed like another similar example of, like, oh, there's, like, a vulnerability at scale in a distributed system. Um, anyway, yes, I'll pass it to Steven. Um, so for me, um, I pretty much think of it as basically a trade-off between speed and ergonomics. And so, yeah, Rust, C++, and C basically perform a lot better than any other language out there, mostly because of uh, garbage collection. And so I felt like the article kind of hit stated like oh it handles memory kind of magically when there is um some trade-offs when you want to go for that speed and so um i actually saw a talk many years ago about rust and it was i kind of kept it on like the corner of my eye uh for like a long time but i never i don't really fully understand it and so this is my how it works basically instead of managing memory manually and like having to explicitly say delete this manually in c and c plus plus to get that performance you basically have an ownership model where you say this thing owns that that thing owns that and so if the owner is gone then you can just delete it and that's my basic gist of how i feel like it works but i could be totally wrong but anyway like basically what i think is what's happening is with ergonomics is you basically have those cases where they kind of randomly bite you and it could take like a really long time to figure out the problem. Um, that's 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 uh, one part of ergonomics. The second type of ergonomics is uh, easier to learn. And the third type of ergonomics I think a lot about is, um, what was it again? Um, flexibility. And so um, for me, Rust, really fast, pretty much as fast as you can go. But um, it trades off a bit of easy to learn, but it has a very strong, um, it blocks you from like biting yourself and bumping into those problems that take forever to fix, which happens a lot in C and C++. And so very often you don't need that speed. And so when you do something, write something like an operating system or a distributed system or something that just is really core, then you need that speed. And so basically, you're, you're, you're forced in a, in a decision to write in C, C++, or Rust, really. And so a lot of the people from C, C++ probably move on to Rust because they kind of have to, because they need that speed. And so very often, like me, I don't need that speed. So I've never programmed in Rust. But I have programmed in C++ a long, long time ago. And so I, I kind of optimize more towards ergonomics um, but like the whole community developer community these days is not really optimizing for speed at all or really ergonomics in my opinion because most people are kind of moving towards JavaScript which is used more often in the web and people tend to not want to jump around languages a lot so they stay in the JavaScript TypeScript world a lot and that's a lot easier for hiring and I think that's what the developer community is kind of moving towards these days. And uh, so it's not really optimizing for speed or ergonomics, just easy to hire and consistent language between the web front end and the back end. And uh, those are my thoughts. Venkat? All right. Yeah, this uh, article, I think, is. Uh just beyond my literacy level, um, partly because I haven't programmed much at all in a very long time, but 
all the experience of programming I do have, I think it's on like um, uh, weekly typed or untyped languages and at a level where memory safety type issues are basically uh, were never a concern. Uh, and uh, even the limited amount of C I've uh, done very long ago never got to the level where any of this was an issue. So my understanding is basically at the level of um, and in informal um, pointy-haired boss uh, manager type conversations with people who do program with such things. So um, I'll take my own prompt in order. So in terms of um, elifying uh, what memory safety is, um, a very experienced programmer once explained garbage collection to me in a very simple way, which is if you take all the objects in memory and draw a graph uh, of what's pointing to what via code, you get a large graph, right? A graph of the memory. And garbage collection basically picks out the isolated bits on the graph. So if the graph is disconnected and there's bits and pieces nothing is pointing to, uh, that's garbage and you throw it away. And a uh, sort of more familiar example that everybody might have run into of this um, kind of thing is uh, orphan pages on Wikipedia or Rome, where nothing is pointing to it and it's pointing to nothing. So heuristically, it's a good bet that uh, uh, it's uh, garbage if nobody else is touching it. So this, uh, even though I've never come close to programming anything which uh, actually touches this um, kind of uh, concept conceptually, other than like, you know, uh, Rome or Wikipedia level, which is um, text, it struck me as a very good metaphor for um, distributed social systems in one particular way, which is um, homeless people. So uh, studies, uh, sociology of homeless people, um, studies have shown that a big part of what explains their condition is basically their, uh, I actually wrote an article titled are you graph garbage? After I first learned this concept of like garbage collection and how it actually works, I wrote the article called Are You Graph Garbage? Which applied this metaphor of if you draw a social graph of who's connected to whom on like an everyday basis, it sounds harsh, but you're probably the human equivalent of garbage if you're not connected to anybody else. And that's kind of what homeless people strike me as. It's not so much that there's a, a material... Um, uh, shortfalls in like the ability to sustain life because in relatively prosperous Western countries, you can usually find food and even shelter. What's hard is finding uh, relationships. And that's kind of interesting, but it also suggests that uh, memory safety defined in that indirect way of you're not connected to anybody else is not an absolute. It's a relative thing. It's kind of a guess that you're useless. So it doesn't cover the case where maybe hey, you're a solitary person who doesn't really want to be connected to the rest of the world and you're actually living quite a happy life. And then, I don't know, some officious bureaucrat comes up and says, hey, you have no friends. I'm going to like, uh, uh, I don't know, put you in some sort of home and pump you full of medicines. Uh, that's kind of like the social equivalent I was thinking of. Um, and when you talk about computers, uh, I think uh, Nathan's um, example of a checkerboard with adjacent memory and stuff, I think that gets at like type safety in... Uh, uh, oh, sorry, uh, memory safety in um, multi-process environments. Uh, it's not completely clear to me that um, that's the same as the general distributed computing environment. So uh, I would say like a very traditional old-fashioned computer where the systems programming stuff is all written in type-safe uh, languages with strong memory management, and maybe only one uh, user program is running that's written in a sloppy, memory-unsafe way. Maybe that type of memory safety is not really an issue. Uh, but if there's like lots of processes running around that are sloppy with how they allocate memory and like they're using a thousand bytes where they kind of pretended to only have a need for one byte, yeah, that kind of overwriting and stuff can probably happen. And uh, I think the big question in my mind is how does the property of type safety, which tends to make programmers extremely sort of like uh, opinionated and uh, uh, I don't know, excited, how does that actually affect memory safety? Like, why is it that declaring the types of variables actually uh, helps you do this better? 
And partly, of course, it's because you're declaring ahead of time not just the type of variable you want, but implicitly also the size of the memory you want. So if you're declaring an int or a double, you're saying you want so many bytes. If you declare a matrix, you're allocating like a large amount. If you tell the compiler ahead of time, it can plan better in a particular way where it can be like very... Um, uh, I think I can't hear you anymore. Oh, sorry. Can you hear me? Hello? I can. Um, I can. Yeah, I can too. Ah, okay. I don't know about uh, Batman. So I'll just finish my thought quickly. Yeah, so it seems like strongly typed languages allow the compiler to be stupider and work with like a little picture level, whereas if you're sloppily typed or untyped, weakly typed, the compiler is supposed to be very big picture and like understand the program in the largest possible structural way. I think that's um, kind of what happens. But overall, my suspicion is that this Rust example in particular, it's a false sense of security and um, kind of like a, a, a claim to a no free lunch um, property that doesn't actually exist. Because just following this kind of discussion for a long time, it seems to me that uh, memory safety and uh, type safety together don't so much actually make programs more safe as impose more conservative constraints on how programmers code. And that's why I posted the Steve Yagi famous article on conservative versus liberal programmers. So it's like either you're getting a false sense of security and no free lunch properties that don't actually exist, or you're fundamentally being more disciplined and safe in your practices. So that's, I think, what's going on. And as for... Um, yeah, application to like AI memory systems and uh, um, human distributed or individual memory. I think there's a connection here, but uh, yeah, I'm going to have to sit with this and uh, maybe we'll read something about uh, memory that'll help us connect the dots later. But definitely, I think there's a way to think about memory safety and e even type safety um, for the much sloppier and stochastic type memories that um, are involved in uh, human and AI memory management. Okay, so that's my thought. Ben, are you talking right now? Oh, no, sorry. Uh, oh. Yeah, I, uh, I, I'm not sure if we want, if I'm the one responsible for uh, uh, wrapping it up. Um, uh, did uh, Anand go or did you listen? Uh, I, I'm largely, largely on a listen mode today. I'm still recovering from my illness. I, cool. sorry. I have nothing more to add. Thank you. All right, then uh, I guess since we're pretty much out of time, um, if anyone has any like final remarks for a minute or two, they can talk. But otherwise, I think that wraps up a pretty good uh, session. A uh, lot to say, a lot of thinking. So uh, um, yeah, if anyone has anything else, otherwise, I guess we'll end it. I just have a question. Jenna put here these uh, PO apps. What is this? Po app? Yeah. I'm not yeah, I'm not sure. I've never actually done this. I think it's some kind of like NFT. It's a or proof of attendance NFT. Yeah. Yep. Well what does it have to do with uh session with today's call? You uh, get a little badge for attending, basically. I think that's the point there. Ah uh, okay, yes, yes. It's the collectible that says that you attended proof of attendance protocol. Yes. 